Hi there, and welcome to Side Quest, the Authors and Dragons in Between podcast. When we're not adventuring, we're talking about geek stuff or current events or interviewing fascinating guests. Uh, before we get into what we're doing today, I'll introduce the regulars. We've got myself, Steve Weverell. We've got Drew Hayes, Rick Walteri, and Robert Bevan. How are you doing, guys? Howdy, howdy. Doing good. Hello, friends. Now, we've got something a little bit different today. And to give some context, most of you will be familiar with our At The Movies segment, where we talk loudly over a movie for your enjoyment. Uh, and we recently had one recommended by our chat, kind of out of the blue. And we ended up being baffled, amazed, and amused by it in equal measures, I think is fair to say. That movie was Karis Hell, and we are privileged to have the writer, director, producer, and star, I believe, of Karis Hell with us today. Unfortunately, I also started in it, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's Steve Rosinski. How are you doing, Steve? Hey, everyone. Steve Rosinski here. You might have heard from me about uh, from a movie called Karis Hell. I don't know if it's uh, ever been spoken on the show, but, well, it just was, so fuck. <laughs> <laughs> well, interview over. Fine. Nice to nice meet you. <laughs> yeah, Karis Hell was re- released in 2016. It's an ultra-low budget indie horror. Very self-aware indie horror comedy, I guess, and uh, made kind of a lot of noise considering, you know, how how little budget it was punching with at the time. Yeah, it surprisingly picked up pretty solidly. In 2016 itself, it, like, won a decent amount of, like, awards or it got placed on a bunch of, like, best of lists for a bunch of horror websites, which is cool. And that helped to get picked up by Wild Eye releasing in 2017 who didn't release it officially until 2019. And then when they pushed it, it got a whole new wave of people that never knew it existed before. And again, another wave of people that were super into it and really liked it and talked about it. And then in uh, 2020, they finally put it onto like included with Prime and Tubi TV. And that's when a whole bunch of people found it by chance and were like, what the fuck is this? This is (laughs) wonderful. And it got picked up way more, like way more. The amount of like reach that this film has had is at times surreal and amazing and weird. I don't get it, but I'll take it. It is worth pointing out for anyone listening who may not have watched a film and go, please remedy that as soon as possible. Uh, Carousel is insane. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a horror movie about a carousel unicorn uh, Nazi who... Get Question sick mark. of being treated badly. <laughs> Question mark. Possible <laughs> Nancy. Gets sick of being treated badly, comes to life, and goes on a murder spree, leading to all kinds of shenanigans. It's incre- it turns out to be an incredibly well-armed and quite inventive uh, carousel <laughs> unicorn. Yeah. I, think, I think for our listeners, the thing that counts most is that this movie is funny as fuck. And I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, we're, we're, all, we're all comedy writers here, so we kind of like, you know, we're probably a hard audience. <laughs> well, I'm glad so that the hard audience still appreciated the humor in this movie. I know I'm hard right now. <laughs> I mean, I'd hope so with what's in this film. The Absolutely. sexiest love scene on film. That is well, true. if you see if you see the uncut version, it was cut out on Tubi TV and Prime Video. I still jacked it. <laughs> oh my god, there's an uncut version. Oh yeah, the original 2016 version, the version that was originally available for rent with money from Wild Eye, but then they went through a new aggregator and re-uploaded it. They cut it down from a TV MA to like a TV 14 plus or TV like 17 plus, um, in order to make sure that it doesn't gr- get removed from Prime and Tubi later. But if you buy the DVD or if you subscribe to SteveBuster.com for as low as 2.99 a month, you can get access to the full version of the film in which that's a full sex scene between sarah and duke it's not just some horn stroking and then cut to black there's multiple positions of sex well damn now i feel cheated (laughs) yeah i don't think there's anything else we can say on this podcast to convince people to watch this movie (laughs) i mean obviously if you want if you want to try it out first tubi is a very viable legitimate way to try it out first but if you like the movie I would definitely suggest Steve Buster or buying a DVD to get the full intent hashtag Radzinski cut. Ah, excellent. Yeah, go do that. Obviously, finish listening to the podcast first. <laughs> when you finish listening to the podcast, <laughs> go and do that immediately. Okay, so I'm, I'm really quite fascinated because uh, it is kind of a pleasure just to stumble on something so unique and entertaining. And I'm quite fascinated by the process of ultra-low-budget filmmaking. 
as it is. So how did you get into this groove? What started you out? Uh, in terms of, and this comes up a lot whenever I talk about just my life and the decisions that led to this horrible choice of being a filmmaker. Uh, my biggest advice to anyone thinking about being a filmmaker, don't. Um, <laughs> but the very, very, very first seed that was planted was literally just watching Army of Darkness when I was a kid. I was like 12, I want to say, when I first saw Army of Darkness. And seeing that movie is what made me go, that's what I want to do. That's unbelievable. Like, There's... I, I studied film in university, and there are so many people who get into filmmaking. And you're like, oh, why did why do you like filmmaking? And I just, ah, Evil Dead. Yeah, <laughs> Sam Raimi is a huge level of inspiration as a creator. Um, as Absolutely. an actor, it's both Bruce Campbell and Jim Varney, which I'm sure you can tell. So from there on, throughout you know grade school, high school, my later teenage years, I was making awful high eight mini dv whatever fucking backyard movies that i could they were awful but i just kept doing it because i liked it um in about like 2007 i was like yeah i got a dvx 100b this camera costs like thousands of dollars to film in 480p it's gonna be great um <laughs> and i'm gonna make a feature film and it's gonna be awesome because i've been doing i've been doing this for years at this point and it uh was awful it's called basic slaughter it is not available anymore except on steve buster because people want to watch me suffer and they demanded it <laughs> um but it, it, you gotta give the people what they want yeah exactly hey if you're giving me money i'm a whore i will do anything Oh, um, welcome to the podcast. You're in the right place. <laughs> I like this guy. Uh, but it was very, 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 very bad. And it was no one's fault but my own. Uh, so I kind of took that loss as a learning thing. In 2008, I did like an online series um, called VG Spoofs just as to like keep practicing, to keep on pushing, and not as something to even sell, but just to make something um 2009 i didn't really do much i was so focused on like trying to survive in life at that point and, and then 2010 is when i said okay no this is what i want to do this is what i'm doing this is this is my path so in 2010 i started work on what i consider my actual first movie even if this one's a short at 35 minutes uh the slasher hunter and i released that in 2011 january 2011 10 years as of this month, oh God, give me a second here. I got uh, a glass full of straight whiskey that's about to become a half glass. <laughs> this is my life. <laughs> I should have become a dentist like mom wanted. Yeah. Okay. Um, but like people really liked it. Like it got uh, horror reviewers enjoyed it. It was a parody of 80s slasher movies. The idea was that there's this thing called the survivor gene, and that's why like one out of every 10 kids survives a slasher. One kid so happens to be so full of the shit that, like, everyone within 50 miles is immortal. And so a parody of Freddy and Jason and Michael Myers and Chucky and Leatherface are trying to track this kid down to extract it out of him. So a government agent known as the Slasher Hunter, whose job is it to hunt slashers, is sent to protect this kid. Just a silly, ridiculous idea to parody my favorite genre of film. And people liked it. So I kind of went with that momentum. And then in 2012, I uh, shot and released my first real feature called Everyone Must Die. Uh, that one we made for about $3,000, maybe $3,500. I forget. It's been nine years now. Jesus, I need to have some more whiskey. <laughs> okay. Um, and it was rough. Uh, it's currently on Tubi TV. So if you want to watch my first real feature ever made, you can do it for free. You don't have to give me a cent. It's not really worth a cent, if you ask me, because Act 1 is super rough. There's so much exposition. I was very bad at pacing at that point. But it got picked up for distribution. It got a, relatively speaking, wide release. Uh, some people really liked it. You know, they liked it simply for the blood or the tits. And, you know, there is, there's a lot of dialogue in it. But there is also a lot of humor. And that's kind of where people started to notice my style, which is... Basically, put a bunch of cartoon characters in a situation where the danger is real. Oh, that sounds like a winning formula I to me. I was going to say, you, yeah, I mean, love yeah. blood and tits. <laughs> hey, <laughs> there ain't a set of tits in that movie smaller than, like, Double D, let me tell you. <laughs> you can't maximize those production values. <laughs> in the little amount of money that I have. Got to cover them in blood. Um, 
so but people appreciated everyone must die and at that point two things happened at the same time one i had someone act in everyone must die named zoltan zilai who was super impressed at how well i was able to make a movie for just three thousand dollars and the fact that it got picked up by a company and the fact that it got widely released and sold in stores and stuff that that kind of stuck with him i'll get back to zoltan though because he that'll come back in two years from now uh in 2013 I wanted to make my own tokuzatsu, because I'm a huge fan of tokuzatsu. I love the genre. I've always loved Super Sentai, uh, Kamen Rider, um, Garo, um, Giver. Like, I, I love the series. The odds of me ever being a Power Ranger is always, like, near zero, so I just wanted to make my own. I made Super Task Force 1 with two grand out of my own pocket as a passion project. Uh, people seem to really dig it. That also just got picked up like last week by Tubi TV, which is real fun because I still own the rights to that one. So all that money is mine. That, ooh, that's is cool nice. to know because I was, I was looking at that one on your website. I was like, same, same here. Like, love the guy ever. You know, he's been a big Power Rangers nerd, stuff like that. So I looked at that and I was like, yeah, that's going to be on my list. <laughs> well, I mean, I hope you enjoy it. For the most part, fans of the genre really did dig it. Um, it's just, a, it's just one of those cases where, you know, I had $2,000 to make it. So it kind of is what it is. Mm -hmm. But I rewatched it on Tubi to give myself, you know, that like nickel or whatever Tubi pays out per watch. <laughs> and I was surprisingly like still happy with it. Like, obviously, it's from seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, but for the pocket lint that I had to make the film, I'm very happy with how it turned out. I think it's a solid sort of like superhero origin film. I like the the um, world wouldn't let me be a Power Ranger. So I made my own power <laughs> approach. You got there. That God is damn uh, right. Yeah. It also kind of sounds like a Power Ranger villain origin story, <laughs> if we're being honest. Yeah, but 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 the truth is, I think that's kind of what what stood out about Car Carousel. You could you could feel, you know, obviously not the budget, but you could feel the passion in in that. Well, yeah, I, I, I do want love. to put. I, I I'm making stuff that I love to see. You know, I, for since we just mentioned Carousel, before I continue my autobiography i guess to you guys that aren't as familiar with me outside of Karis hell uh but several people who like reviewed Karis hell or other podcasts or other reviewers they would say something like man i wish the movie took itself seriously and i'm just like then That's the cool. movie wouldn't exist because yeah, i don't want to see no. a serious movie about a killer carousel unicorn no or other people no, be like no, i no. wish i wish the unicorn was animated like i wish it was like a latex unicorn so it can move and move its mouth like Again, the movie wouldn't exist. The point, the core point, is that it's this fucking inanimate carousel unicorn, and that's hilarious. Now, if you don't like that, that's fine. Like, it's subjective. I'm not arguing at all that anyone should like it. But whenever people are like, it should be this, it's just like, I don't want that. I wouldn't want to watch that, so I'm not going to make that. You can, you can make that. I hope they told those podcasts to suck on a unicorn horn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so I really like Tokuzatsu. I wanted to make my own Tokuzatsu, and it's a comedy because I like poking fun at genres, but it's not a parody. I never want to make, aside from the Slasher Hunter, which it was really meant to be that, none of my movies are making fun of said genre. It's just poking fun at tropes. You know, I like, I like movies that are able to be funny, to be able to, um, maybe wink at the camera, but uh, it's... I don't want to say it's bad, but it's not my cup of tea when the movie is staring at the camera with, like, finger guns. Like, that level of self-aware is not my cup of tea. I get where you're coming from. I, I do mm -hmm. like um, one of my favorite authors is Pratchett, uh, Terry Pratchett, and he's a he does fantasy parody, but he still creates very good fantasy books. That's he excellent. doesn't kind of you'd ever dismiss the genre he's just having fun within the genre i think there is a, a big difference there yeah there is yeah. that's exactly what i'm talking about thank you for that example that's wonderful you can tell when some when a parody like has disdain for a genre <laughs> versus versus one which you can tell they're fans of a genre you that, that's usually easy to tell yeah it's like friends like there's a little bit of poking the ribs like between friends but you can tell when it's done with love hmm. For mm. the the topic versus it malice, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Um, all right, so I made Super Task Force. It originally didn't make any fucking money, which I kind of expected because it's a hard sell. <laughs> um, but over time, it actually became one of my most profitable movies thanks to Prime Video, 
because Amazon Prime allows creators to submit to the service directly, which gives access to oh. everyone with Amazon Prime. I, I, I did have a question about Amazon, Amazon Prime Video because, uh, you know, as content creators ourselves, we're always like very interested in making sure that like, you know, the content creators get paid for their work. You you are fairly compensated, like, you know, because Not as Prime members. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, I was about to I was actually about to answer your question before you even asked. Them. So they used to pay like 12 cents per hour stream, which was fucking nuts. Like they were stupid wow. paying that much. I was making so much fucking money. <laughs> I was making fuck you money with pieces of shit like two thousand dollar movies. Then they cut it. Then they cut it down to six cents, which some people bitched about. But I was like, no, this is fair. Absolutely, this is fair. Then they cut it down to four cents, and I was like, okay. Again, this still makes sense. You know, they now their library is so much bigger. Now uh, there's so many more movies. Now so many more people are using it. So I get it. Four cents is still a respectable amount. That's four cents per hour streamed. Now it's one cent. Oh, fuck. It is one Ooh, cent man. per hour streamed on, on Prime Video. It, that is better than zero, I assume. Mm. However, it is the worst way to legally support content creators. Oh, that's gone from fuck you money to fuck you, period. Yeah. Money, <laughs> exclamation well, point. It's fine. Jeff Bezos needed a fourth private jet. I understand. He's been hurting. Yeah. Hmm. You're lucky he doesn't charge you. <laughs> you know? I'm expecting that next. Yeah, don't don't say, don't don't give him any ideas because obviously he listens to this stupid podcast. Yeah, yeah. Um, so does. so yeah, I'll say that if you find a content creator you like, like don't get me wrong, Prime is still great to discover new things that you may not otherwise find, like in the algorithm popping up stuff like that. But if you do find something that you do actively like and you want to support it, try to find whatever other avenue that film exists on to support it because even even streaming it on tubi pays us more than streaming it on prime i don't have the exact numbers for tubi because they're ad based as opposed to like minutes based but it's a lot higher or again you know buying it buying a physical copy going to the creator's website seeing what they have available direct anything like that if you like what you find on prime like thank you i mean that but at the same time i got one cent for you watching my movie <laughs> And that's only uh, if I submitted the movie there directly. If a distributor puts the movie on Prime, then I'm getting a cut of one cent. Oh, Jesus Christ, that is <laughs> that's rough. Oh. Yeah, we might have to change. We might have to change our ATM intro to be like, yeah, we got this legal thing on legally obtained movie on Amazon Prime, but fuck those guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um. So yeah. So after Super Task Force, so Result and Zilla is back. Now he approached me. Now, he has, his dad owns, like, this, like, gold and jewelry store. Zoltan has a lot of money that he just sits on and does nothing with. I wouldn't say he's a fucking one percenter, but compared to me, he's definitely rich. Hmm. Um, and he comes to me saying, like, hey, Steve, I was really impressed with everyone's style. I was really impressed with how it released, yada, yada, yada. Um, I would like to pay you to direct a movie for me. And I'm like, absolutely. This is infinitely better than someone coming to me being like i have an idea for a movie go fuck yourself i have my own pile of ideas of movies unless you're paying me i'm not making your movie <laughs> zoltan said i'll pay you to make my movie so he has all of my attention and at first he's pitching this like okay so i kind of saw that movie the strangers um where like killers take a family hostage but i thought it'd be really cool if we kind of do a version of that except the police get there immediately, so it becomes like this tense hostage situation movie. And I'm like, oh, this is very out of my wheelhouse, but I like that. I like doing things I haven't done before, so yes. So I went home and spent a whole week writing up a whole outline of ideas and possible possibilities and characters and like plot points and stuff. And I went to the first official production meeting with Zoltan, and he said, okay, so I drove by a lake. And then I realized that you can make a movie about my character, Captain Z, from my dad's jewelry store. <laughs> and I just ripped up my outline into a bunch of little pieces and went, okay, let's make a fucking commercial about a goddamn pirate. <laughs> and so I, I somehow took this man's insanity and wrote a script called Captain Z and the Terror of Leviathan and got paid money to make this man's insane idea for a fucking movie, and it exists. Ah, so that's what that was. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> He played this character, Captain D, as a local celebrity in, like, the Ohio, West Virginia area for this jewelry store called Z's Jewelry, and it was fucking weird. Like, we were 
shooting the movie and people in town would be like, oh, it's Captain Z. I'm like, what the fuck is this reality? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like we cut for the day. We had we went to a cast dinner at like a sandwich shop nearby and on the TVs, the Captain Z jewelry store commercial popped on. I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Where am I? Yeah, you, you you died and that's that's how the matrix is uh, is fucking with you um, it sells itself it does it, people in that area ate it up people outside that area did not eat it up as i expected um that's fair but it's still a movie that we had about fifteen thousand dollars to make that movie and i think that movie turned out great you know like we we were able to take over entire parts of like downtown wheeling they the city let us take control of the waterfront. We had a full crew. We had a great cast. I think for what the movie is, it's a hilarious, fun time. It punches above its own weight class. It has a great climax. I I like Captain Z, but man, that would never be the first movie of mine I tell someone to watch. Uh, it sounds so like weird. Captain Z Captain Z ran that town, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he did. Captain Z was the dawn of whatever weird pocket dimension you were in. Um, Wheeling was a weird city. Uh, it was a dead city where like nobody lived, and the most of the buildings were dilapidated. So the city co- government's plan to fix up the city was not to fix the buildings, but to buy printed fake building signs to put over the dilapidated building so that it looked nice. What? Yes. Oh. <laughs> that sounds like a bad sitcom it, idea I that gets felt shot like I was down in a the Scooby Doo ghost town. Were these were these buildings 90% sign? <laughs> Great, I need to visit this place. <laughs> it really sounds like if you if you did a behind the scenes documentary on this, it would just be absolutely fascinating. I should have, but I was a, I was very busy. It was a rough shoot, not a bad shoot, but it was rough. I was very tired. Um, because that was that was the first time it happened to me, where you know I acted in the Slasher Hunter only because there was a Freddy Krueger parody, and I always do a Freddy Krueger impersonation like as a joke. So like, yeah, I'm gonna do that. I had a small role in Everyone Must Die to save, you know, one actor rate a day. That's it. Uh, Captain Z comes around like, oh, great, well, have a real budget. I don't have to act in it because I don't have to save money. So I'll just write the script however I want. And Zoltan got the script and said, hey, you're going to be the co-lead. I'm like, I don't want to be the co-lead, Zoltan. Yeah, you are. It's in your contract. Fuck. <laughs> okay. Captain Z decrees it. <laughs> So, so it shall yeah. be. Can't say no to the guy with the money. That's that's the big rule in the business. Cannot say no to the guy with the money. Like this um, is my reality. <laughs> I own you. Um I, I hate starring in my movies that I write and direct unless I'm forced to be for financial reasons. Uh because one, that's an insane amount of extra work. And two, it ain't a good look when the writer director is also the fucking star. Yeah, I get where you're coming from. I, I thought it was a fine look. We, um, all, we all love the pizza guy, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, two minds about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, two yeah, words for I'll you. get Quentin to that, right. uh, <laughs> Again, hit and miss. I, I will kill myself <laughs> before I become Quentin Tarantino. Um. So, after Captain Z, you know, we had a good... You know, like, actually, at first, the movie was a hit. Like, we were selling copies like fucking hotcakes. I assume sell well. I don't know why hotcakes is the analogy everyone uses. I'm not sh- certain how well those sell. No, me neither. I don't, I'm not sure I've even <laughs> ever had a hotcake. Um, but... but it was doing really well, so we were, so we had to rode that momentum, and that's when we first came up with the idea. Alina Isley and I came up with the idea of Karis Hell. We wrote the script, and we launched the original Kickstarter, and we raised $1,000 out of $15,000. And it failed. So... Uh, we had enough money that we got the horse. We did get the carousel horse because that was about $1,200 by itself. And we were like, at the time, we were like, okay, we'll paint it. And then in spring of 2016, we'll like do a short and hopefully the short picks up some steam and then we can try another Kickstarter to make the feature. So in 2015, I had like nothing to do. I didn't really have anything. So I hate found footage films and i hate torture horror films so i said all right i'm gonna make a found footage torture horror film because i hate (laughs) these things and see what it's like also i'm gonna write this in a way that i can film the whole thing in two days and five hundred dollars and i know this shit's gonna sell at horror conventions Hmm. i was right 
So I made a movie called Red Christmas, and I don't know what to think of it. Some people really like it, and I'm not sure why, but again, I don't like the genres. Maybe they do, and it's made a bunch of money at horror conventions, and that's the only reason why the movie exists. That takes uh, a lot of creative guts, I would think, to to find a couple of genres and think, well, I know other people like these. I don't, but I'll give it a go anyway. And, uh, yeah, that's some moxie. Really intensively no, yeah. do that. Again, I like to do things that I haven't necessarily done before. Yeah, yeah. but things that you actually dislike, that's uh, another level. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to see what my flavor of that would be. You know, so like the idea, the plot of that one is that um, it's about a woman that kidnaps, tortures, and kills a couple of guys every year at around Christmas time. And she's making kind of a video diary explaining how and why in case she's ever caught so that other people can see what she did in order to not get caught for so long. Pragmatic public, public service. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, the fun twist in that is that uh, spoilers for this movie from 2015 that no one is ever going to watch. Um, <laughs> she actually hates the torture. She thinks it's gross and fucked up and like disturbing. She hates it, but she does it. Because if she tortures the body first, the FBI will be developing a completely incorrect profile for who they think the killer is. All she wants is to kill the guys via strangulation so that they get hard and she can fuck their corpses. Of course. Yeah. That's why I do it. <laughs> that's, 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 actually, that's actually super clever. I mean, not, not the fucking their corpses, that which, which is, but the whole concept of I'm going to kill people ways that I don't like just to fuck with the FBI sort of looking for somebody else. Exactly. I gotta say, it's probably <laughs> the most legitimate explanation I've heard for torture porn horror movies, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I'm glad. Um, but then, so, so I finished Red Christmas. You know, it's fine. It is what it is. It was a breeze to edit because it's literally just, we shot it in sequence and it's a home video, basically. So aside from an intro that I did shoot correctly and cut and like have scored it's basically just this actress held the camera most of the time or set it up on a tripod and just hit stop start and stop that's it it was it was the easiest movie i've ever made yeah <laughs> i just i didn't like it but it was fucking easy <laughs> um so i'm at my christmas party my christmas party like my personal christmas party for my friends and i'm there with four people like in the kitchen with four people and someone easy. asks, Hey Steve, what's up with Karis Hell? I saw that it didn't get the Kickstarter. I'm like, yeah, we failed the Kickstarter, yada, yada, yada. Uh, you know, we weren't able to get the money, but you know, we got the horse. So if we're able to do a short, maybe we'll see what happens after that. And Rob Steinbach, who is a longtime friend of mine, who showed up to be an extra on Captain Z and had a blast that day, who flew up from Florida to my house for the Christmas party and watched Captain Z on the way and was just laughing about how much of a joy of a film it was. And he liked Captain Z said, well, how much money do you need for Carousel? And I said, well, the budget's at about 15,000, you know, cause we want to pay everyone. We want to pay for good effects. We need to pay for a location. And he said, well, I got that. I'll just give it to you. Uh, uh, what? <laughs> are you, are you fucking serious right now? He's like, yeah, I'll just, I'll just do it. So I was like, okay, you're drunk. Come back tomorrow when you're sober. He came back the next day sober and said, yeah, I want to pay for your fucking movie. I was like, do you want to be creative? I was like, nope, I want nothing to do with it. I just want to give you the money and let you make this movie because everything that you've described about this movie sounds hilarious, so I want it to exist. Christmas miracle. In the industry, it was a Christmas miracle. In the, in the industry, this is what we call a fucking unicorn, and you will never find one as a filmmaker. I should have never found one as a filmmaker, but it happened. Merry Christmas. Nice. That is awesome. So the only reason why Karis Hell exists, to be clear, is not only because of Aline Isley and I writing the story, but because Rob Steinbach wanted it to exist because he thought Captain Z was such a fun movie, which only exists because Zoltan thought I did a good job and everyone must die, which only exists because I wanted to try to be a fucking filmmaker. Dominoes. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess I was mistaken. I, uh, I While we were watching it, I, I did a a little bit of internet research, and I, I thought the budget was five thousand dollars. No, five thousand was just the budget on the effects on that movie. Oh. Like one third of our entire budget, I gave to the effects guy. I, I, I gotta say, it was money well spent because one thing we were noting as we were watching it was that uh, the practical effects. I mean, for all the silliness of the unicorn, 
the practical effects are pretty uh pretty good <laughs> yeah those kills look fucking nice yeah that is cody rook uh the who is coming back for carousel the second i would like to say that now <laughs> Um, but I gave him, like, I basically wrote him a check and said, okay, this is your pay and all of the effects. You split it however you want. Whatever you can do and stay on budget, you can do. Like, there's kills in the script that he made gorier when we got to set. Uh, like the, uh, the Pez dispenser head. In the script, oh, yeah. that was, uh, punches the head off, like, a la Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th Part 8. Yeah. That's all that was. And he said, what if I had the head split in half? I'm like, can you afford to do that? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck, do it. <laughs> can you afford not to do that? Well, and, an and another thing that I think is why the effects look so good, in addition to Cody himself being so skilled and talented at what he does, and us putting that extra money into the effects, because again, it was a funny movie. I made the movie to be a funny movie, but it's still in the horror genre, so having yeah. good-looking practical effects still matters to me as a fan of horror. We really appreciated that, yeah. yeah. Uh, as we kind of we watched. I think our first introduction on our at the movies podcast to like ultra low budget but highly self aware and uh, skillfully kind of dance in that line movies was Velocipasta. Yes. So we kind of knew what to expect when we saw like the unicorn floating along. We were just kind of well, we know how this works with ultra low budget. We kind of. We understand the relationship between viewer and creator here because it's ultra low budget. <laughs> but then when the first kill happened with the drunk clown getting, uh, you know, stabbed in the neck with a unicorn horn, we were like, oh, no, that's actually really good. That's actually <laughs> you know, really high quality kind of uh, practical effect. Uh, I appreciate this drunk clown yeah. dying in this manner. It's, uh... yeah. he, he did an awesome, an awesome job. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, Andy's great. There are certain things. There's certain things that, that CGI does well and certain things that it does shitty. Uh, pretty much any fright effects tends to be that. But uh, mm. but yeah, it's like uh, th th those those kills really elevate the movie. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. And th it was, again, that was important to me. And one of the things that as well, like as a writer, as a director, as a fan of the genre, whenever I'm making a horror film, and this is applies to all of my other stuff too, not just cares hell specifically but i'm always just like there needs to be a kill a good kill within like the first 10 minutes of a movie yeah because i don't want anyone looking at their watch waiting for act three to show up before the blood happens and i've seen a lot of independent movies that do that and it's tiring and boring oh, God, so don't... i i want a good kill very soon and one of my other lines in the sand, as soon as the idea came out of, like, Aline's mouth, and before we even started writing, I was just like, okay, only one kill is by a horn. <laughs> only one. The first one. And it, there ended up being a second one, because it made sense, given the, like, location. But I was like, I want him to use weapons. Why? Because yeah. it'd be fun. And oh, yeah, as was. much as that first horn kill set a great, gory standard, it was the second one, I think it was the machete... <laughs> uh, where you like you see the hooves like holding it behind the guy and that was sort of the click and i was like oh this is gonna be a fucking fun ride mm. good thank you i'm glad because that the machete and the ninja stars are that yeah it's that it, like if you like the movie by the end of the uh like the the proposal scene is what i like to call it then you're gonna like the movie if you don't then you're done like nothing nothing else is gonna change your mind yeah, that was kind of it for me. It was like we were trying to suss it out and where the movie was coming from and how self-aware it was. And then a carousel unicorn kills a guy with shuriken. And we're like, <laughs> yes, okay. We're all on the same page here. Yeah, at that point, you're like, this movie has no fucks to give and it is glorious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That is absolutely my intent with the film. I'm really glad that you guys got it exactly how... I meant for it to be taken. That means a lot to me, honestly, as a creator. Well, I thought it was a really, you know, not just the effects and not just the self-aware, goofy concept. I thought it was a really tight script. There was uh, just the increasing kind of self-awareness of the unicorn itself and the parody of, like, situations we've seen in other movies. I mean, the whole pizza guy, somebody's <laughs> trying to fuck the pizza guy, but he just wants to get paid. And it just spins out as this perfect comedy bit. <laughs> yeah, the, I think I'm a piece of fucking garbage, and I'm not very good at a lot of things in life. 
But if there's one thing I do give myself credit for, it's my writing. And honestly, that is the thing that is most often touted as good in my movies are my scripts. And I take that. That I do wear as a badge of honor. I'm prideful in that. So that makes me happy to hear you say that. Uh, good pacing, good explanations, even if they're insane uh, motivations, characters, and overarching bits are all things that are very important to me when I watch films and thus are very important to me when I write films. Now, I was just going to say, there's a cleverness there. Because, I mean, I've, I've watched a lot of, like, low-budget, like, you know, horror comedy movies. And the comedy a lot of times falls really flat really flat like it's kind of painful to watch and you know to have something where it's like where you're watching it and you're like holy crap it, 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 this is somebody who knows how to how to write jokes how to write like not only just one-offs but essentially like a whole thread that's just leaving it leading up to punchlines. it was uh it was great you're making me blush rick <laughs> and not just a pizza guy too i did like little characters like the really intensely serious party goer <laughs> and the fact that some other serial killer had turned up to that exact party and was really bummed yeah. that a unicorn was taking his thunder. There were so many. There were parts of the party scenes where I thought, had this just been a one room comedy without any of the unicorn, I, I still would have really enjoyed this. Oh, thank you so much. I, a lot of folks like hate any moment of the movie without the unicorn, and that's fine. Obviously, again, subjective. That's not a wrong opinion. But I like these characters. I, you know, like that's why I made them. I uh, I liked jokes about the budget constraints, like when the unicorn said, "Ah, I can't blink." <laughs> <laughs> um. So, but you were saying you liked the the killer. You thought that was a good joke that worked. Yeah. Like the other killer being at the party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I like that a lot too. <laughs> well, I think yeah. on top of all the chaos, and then just to throw that in, it's like, oh man, I was going to kill these people. <laughs> well, I think that worked especially well because it, it was uh, foreshadowed a little bit in what seemed like a throwaway joke with the I never bit. Yeah. Like, yeah. I liked that a lot of what appeared to be throwaway jokes got looped back in later on, like the shut the front door thing, um, the serial killer with at the I never game. Like, there, there were a lot of like those little ones, and... When Rick says cleverness in the comedy, that is especially like a standout to me. Like if you follow the threads, it pays you off, and that that's always great. Like, yeah, that kind of so Edgar nice. Wright school of screenwriting going on there. <laughs> yeah. As as we were yeah, as we were talking of the movie, I think several times we were like, "Well, wouldn't it be funny if this or so?" And then it happened, and it was just like, <laughs> "This is great." That makes me really happy. I'm very happy to hear people that catches that because that's one of the things. Like comedy is very hard. As you said, like it's comedy more than anything else is so subjective. Um, so one of the things that I want to do when I'm doing comedy is I want to put in so many jokes that even if half of them don't land, there's still enough jokes that it's a good movie. Hmm. That's part hmm. of my sort of idea when I'm writing comedy. Um, also, just because of how I write, there's very rarely any completely throwaway jokes. Almost everything's going to come back in some way. Um, but I still want to write things in a way that no matter what, anyone can appreciate them the best that I can. So I, the reason why I asked and clarified that the uh, murderer at this party worked for you guys is that that's Axe, who is a returning character from several several of my previous films. And at first, wow. I was afraid of putting him in that it would be like alienating to people only seeing Carousel. So I tried to write it in a way that it didn't matter that it was Axe. But if you've seen Slasher Hunter... And Red Christmas. As soon as you see him, you're like, "Is that fucking axe?" And then he shows up with his fucking axe later in the film. I'm kind of glad I didn't see them because I, I think it it works better as the the joke leading up to the reveal. Yeah, it works perfectly as a self contained joke. So, yeah. good. I'm but glad. But it's a nice bonus for anyone who's been following it. So that's cool. Um, but d just to, before you guys get into more questions on Carousel, since we're finally caught up to this point in my career. Um, the reason why I'm in this movie is similar to my Captain Z story, which is I wrote this script with Elaine. Uh, she wrote about, she will say the same thing. It was like 70% me, 30% her. Uh, the core idea of Killer Carousel Unicorn named the movie Carousel, 100% her. <laughs> the motivation of the Carousel Unicorn of hunting down a bratty piece of shit kid, also her. But when we get into like characters, dialogue, pacing, plot points, then it becomes the 70-30 of the script writing. So whenever I say we wrote it, I want to make it clear that this movie would not exist without Aline Isley, but that I'm very good at writing jokes. 
<laughs> um, oh. but so I so we finished writing it, and Elaine goes, "You gotta play Joe the Pizza Guy. This is the perfect character for you." I'm like, "I don't want to fucking act in the fucking movie. I got forced to act in fucking Captain Z. I just want to focus on directing Carousel. That's all I want to do." Scott Lewis, the cinematographer, reads the script and he says, "Steve, you gotta play Joe the Pizza Guy. This is the perfect character for you. This is exactly the kind of character you play. I don't want to fucking play Joe the fucking Pizza Guy. I'm not gonna be in this fucking movie. I just want to fucking direct. If I'm gonna be anyone, I'll be fucking Clark, the one that dies in like five seconds, or I'll be the punching guy. I'm not gonna be the fucking co-lead of the film." Producer reads the script. The guy with the money. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, Steve, you're gonna be Joe the Pizza Guy. God fucking damn it, I'm gonna be Joe the Pizza Guy. Yes I am, Rob. I'm gonna I'm gonna be Joe Pizza Guy. I'm so excited to be Joe the Pizza Guy. I think I speak on behalf of the podcast when we say uh we're really glad you're Joe the Pizza Guy. Hmm. We've we will fucking love Joe the Pizza Guy. Thank you. Thank you. Almost everyone agrees with you, which means I'm wrong. But Most I still need to The guy with the money <laughs> is always right. <laughs> Clearly. So as I said, Carousel got picked up by Wild Eye releasing in 2017. But they outright said, we have a lot of backlog where we're going to release this later. It's not going to come out for a couple of years. Which, that makes sense. That's fine. It happens a lot in independent film, especially um, with like the somewhat larger distributors like Wild Eye. They have a lot of movies that they pick up, and they kind of have a plan of when it comes out. Um. But I can't make another, like, five-figure movie when the first movie isn't even out yet. You know, how, how can I sell that to an investor? How can, I sell, how can I justify that to myself out of pocket? So at that point, I was like, okay, I guess I'm just going to take a break for a while. Uh, my good friend, my brother, Bill Murphy, and I had a review podcast at the time, which no longer is ongoing, but the episodes still exist, I think, on SoundCloud, Movie Films with Bill and Steve. And we started watching some talking animal Christmas films. And holiday films. And except for one, and I'm going to give uh, some free advertising here, The Three Dogateers is self-aware and knows exactly what the fuck it is, and it's hilarious. Everything else we watched kept making me angrier and angrier because they were all just garbage, but with, like, such clearly high budgets. The one that finally <laughs> broke me was the dog who saved Christmas. <laughs> Fuck the dog who saved Christmas. All my homies hate the dog who saved Christmas. And it's because it's the most milk toast, poorly uninspired ripoff of Home Alone. Without any originality, without any good jokes, poor acting. They spent all of their money on fucking Dean Kane showing up and this mansion that they shot in. But like, like, this movie clearly had at least $500,000 to get made for the ABC network, and there's no soul, there's no passion, there's no creativity, and it made me so angry that I said, fuck it, Bill, I have 500 spare dollars and a cat. I'm gonna make a Home Alone ripoff. What should I call it? Oh, wait, no one has made a movie called A Meowy Christmas yet? Well, guess I'm making a fucking movie called A Meowy Christmas before <laughs> someone else does. I always say this. Spite is the greatest creative motivator. It was completely made out of spite that first movie. It certainly is but mine. It, <laughs> but I'm still me, which means I am insane. So even though I made it to purposely be a ripoff of Home Alone, the plot is about a cat that watches Alex Jones videos all day. <laughs> so she thinks that she knows the truth that the CEOs have kidnapped Santa Claus to make you buy presents from them so they can get richer. And these two burglars breaking in are lizard aliens because she knows the truth. Well, of course. Oh. <laughs> Home me out alone. <laughs> <laughs> So I just tossed that on Prime, didn't give a shit. This was still like the four cent an hour era of Prime. This was one of the few, few, few times in my life where I actually made a movie for fun instead of like as a business decision. Kids fucking loved it. People fucking loved it. It made so much money on just Prime, never mind the physical sales. I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm going to scratch another one of my itches that I've always had. And that's making a PG horror movie because I fucking love shit like Paranorman and Ernest Scared Stupid and like yeah. anything that's oh, non R rated yeah. horror or PG 13 rated horror. I love that. Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult genre to put. There aren't many contenders in it, but uh, <laughs> Ernest Scared Stupid, yeah, it's a yeah. classic. 
Oh, yeah, huge. arguably too scary. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe a little <laughs> on the too scary side. But if you get it right, if you hit that sweet spot, you know, there's not a lot to contend with, but there are some greats in there. So well, that's why. In, so in 2018, I made I made and released a Meowy Halloween. So less than a year later, I released this. I made and released the sequel to Meowy Christmas. Um, I feel it only cost like three hundred dollars out of my pocket. And I filled it with so many horror references. There's like 40 horror movie references in this movie uh, for the adults. And that's why I think it it fucking did great with kids. Because I think there's not a lot of PG horror options these days that are new. Uh, but it also did great with horror fans because of all the references they were not expecting at all. One example is that uh, there's a puzzle box in the film that at one point the cat plays with and the rat says, hey, you shouldn't mess with that. Yeah, you're right. We got other stuff to do. 30 minutes later, uh, my police partner picks up the box and goes, oh, hey, need a puzzle box. Moves it a little bit. It clicks. You see a bright white light and hear chains. And then that character disappears forever. <laughs> of course, that's what you want in a kid's movie is a Hellraiser exactly. reference. Exactly. <laughs> oh, um, I, I was thinking there was the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, oh yeah, no, Hellraiser. <laughs> Rick, canonically in my children's film, a character goes to hell. He's got. Don't worry, kids. He's just been ripped apart by rusty chains. Anyway, moving <laughs> on. They have so um, many <laughs> things to show him. So, a Meowy Halloween financially speaking, is the best decision I've ever made in my life. That thing sells so many fucking copies. When Carousel finally got its official release and I started hitting, like, the horror convention market, I sold more copies of a Meowy Halloween than I did of Carousel. Go figure. (laughs) There's a few people on this podcast with kids, so never underestimate the uh, ability of a movie made for kids that a grown-up can, like, chuckle at at the background. You know, the appeal of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so because of that success, I was like, okay, for some reason, these cat movies are super cheap and easy to make and make money. I'm going to end it. I'm not going to fall into the trap of doing this for the rest of my goddamn career. Uh, so let me do an actual ending. So, uh, 2019, I was busy, uh, like writing and then shooting Maui three and four at the same time. But people only thought I was making Maui three. So oh. early, so an early. To- I kept on like I only announced a Meowie St. Patrick's Day. I kept on talking about like I can't believe I'm going to be making three cat movies. I kept that up for a year. Kayfabe <laughs> is not dead. <laughs> oh, um, I respect the shit out of that. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so Meowie three, a Meowie St. Patrick's Day is basically a Freaky Friday idea where my cat and I switch bodies. So I play my cat in my human body in order to get a leprechaun to switch his back. Um. At one point, the ghost of the rat speaks to the cat because, unfortunately, our pet rat passed away. And instead of lying and getting a new rat, I told kids that animals die. But his soul <laughs> can still speak to the cat. Well, that's and, right be- and since there's a hole in the afterlife, right before the rat leaves, Rick pops out and starts yelling, Oh, oh, oh I got away! I can't go back there! And then he just leaves. And that's the only appearance he has in a Meowie 3. <laughs> just smuggling horrific existential crises into a children's movie is wonderful uh, so the film ends with the leprechaun basically saying I can undo the curse and switch you back but it's going to cost $20 <laughs> they only have $5 and he says okay I'll do it but there's going to be side effects and he snaps his fingers my body disappears the cat goes, goes back into her mind and says hey okay I guess everything's fine I don't know where Wally is but where else would he be post credit scene, Wally falls from the sky. Rick runs up with an eye patch, saying, like, where have you been, Wally? It's been 25 years. Lizard aliens have taken over the world. <laughs> and that's the only, that's the first time Meowie 4 got announced was the post credit scene of 3. So I ended on a goddamn cliffhanger. And then finally, later in 2020, Meowie Christmas Vacation, which is one last fuck you to the dog who saves Christmas, because they double-dipped and released a movie called the dog who saved Christmas vacation <laughs> as a parody of big summer blockbuster ending movies like Endgame and the rise of Skywalker, where it's just ridiculous insanity. There's time travel 
Wally has to fight a fucking alien emperor, and I do it in a wrestling ring as a five minute long wrestling match because I'm insane and it's my movie, and I know people are gonna buy it anyway at this point. <laughs> these cat movies. Do you dress the alien like Keith David, or is it just implied? <laughs> no, it's uh, it's actually a slight spoiler, but uh, the villain of Super Task Force One is the villain of a Meowie Christmas Vacation. Uh, he was defeated by my character in Super Task Force and sent through dimensions to another Earth. And when the Emperor Zagel gets to this new Earth, he wants to kill every single person that looks like Jason Oliver. So in the year 2050, he has killed every character I've played in the Silver Spotlight films, except Wally because of time travel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> now that's a cool thing. Oh, that's great. So Meowie Christmas Vacation is the ending. You know, that's the last one. I'm not going back. I'm not saying there. it's impossible that there might be some, like, uh, like a comic book or like a short or something that takes place before four, but like that's the end. That is the final Meowie film. I'm done. I and I, Q- I, Q- a French. I didn't intend that to be a monkey's paw wish, but it happened. Hmm. And uh, we'll be shooting Carousel 2 this April. I love the Woo! fact that you were like, I hate this dog movie. I'm going to get really weird with it. That's <laughs> It can like I, I like the idea of just like introducing just the concepts of the first and the last movie of just like in this one a cat fights a couple of burglars. In this one her owner gets time travel to twenty fifty where lizard aliens have taken over the planet. Wait, but what? It's a logical <laughs> progression. It really is. <laughs> My Alex Jones parody has a full character arc in all four films too. <laughs> oh, God. Well, no, no, no offense, but I, I hope a friend shows up at uh, the next Christmas party and it's like, I got fifteen thousand dollars to make Meowie Five. Okay, no, yeah, for fifteen thousand dollars, I make Meowie Five. It'll be the gris- best goddamn talking animal movie ever made. <laughs> I I wanted to ask you when you mentioned going through and watching the plethora of uh, talking animal Christmas films, we have had one also on at the movies. Did you happen to get to Grumpy Cat's Worst uh, Christmas Ever? No, that one I refused to watch because those owners pumped that poor cat full of so many fucking drugs that I refuse to give them any money. Even oh if it's God. one cent on Amazon oh. Prime. Okay. Well, that's horrifying to find Duh. out. We enjoyed it because uh, Aubrey Plaza is charming as shit. But, oh, well, yeah, she's terrible. great. But, yeah, like as soon as that cat died, I was like, oh, finally, he can rest. Oh, no. <laughs> well, I, I officially declare I missed that out of protest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we could uh, agree Audrey Plaza good drugging cats to death yeah. bad, bad. Uh, yeah bad. when Pete when Peter finally comes for us Bob will be standing there going yeah I told y'all <laughs> <laughs> serves you right for not being hung over that morning <laughs> so did you guys have any questions comments discussions about Carousel specifically then since I've now talked about my entire film library that it was a fascinating journey. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> oh, absolutely. I was. I'd just like to say on the subject of Carousel too, because we watched Carousel and thought, I thought I've got to know more about this. And I was like, holy shit, guys, they are kickstarting Carousel too. But I understand now the Kickstarter is closed. Yes. Okay, so that's is that in the bag then? Carousel two is. Oh, in the bag. Script is written. Casting is done. Poster is being hand drawn as we speak. The uh, son of Duke is being molded right now. Son of Duke, excellent. <laughs> you, th- you didn't think that baby was going to be a one off joke. You just watched the whole movie where one off didn't happen. Well, you know, we, after listening to your career story, apparently nothing is a one off. So. <laughs> yeah. Prior you... to this interview, a little bit, yeah. Let's <laughs> post this interview, no. No, definitely not. <laughs> it's all connected. Yeah. So yeah, we are shooting in April of 2021. So in three months, we will be knee-deep in shooting Carousel 2. We're hoping, um, obviously, no 100% firm promises. I'm not going to promise, but we're aiming for by fall 2021. Carousel. Well, we're definitely going to be following that with interest. Yeah, absolutely. This is the uh, first... Uh... The first movie we've watched on, on Authors and Dragons at the movies where I think a bunch of us had the same idea upon watching it. Because I, you know, immediately after we shut it off, I started thinking, I got to get in touch with this guy. And I was looking <laughs> shit up. And then, and, and then Steve hops on and says, all right, we, uh, he's interested in an interview. What? <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> 
it was a fascinating experience. It was just kind of like we thought we were kind of savvy to the whole ultra low budget self aware film. We watched Santa Jaws, we watched Philosopher Pasta. But there was just some surprising elements. It wasn't like you had this goofy concept that would draw people in like clickbait, like, oh, a carousel unicorn, that's funny. I'll watch this for ironic purposes. Then it was just like there was some sweet effects in there. There's some really uh, tight comedy bits, and there was a lot of kind of self-referencing. This kind of, it's like, you think you're here to make fun of a movie, but the movie's actually making fun of you, kind of <laughs> vibe to it. And uh, we just, you know, it was, a, it was a heck of an experience. And then we found out, it's like, well, it was made on 15 grand. And, oh, he's making a new one. It's just, you know, we had to get you on the show, man. This is great. Yeah, this was different. It was, it was one of those rare specimens where, like, you know, like if if we're watching a movie, you know, we watch them on the show to to make fun of, and you can do that with this movie, but it's not it's not like like where we accidentally watch a good movie and like we just shut up and watch it. It's like kind of like a mix of ha 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 and oh that that was neat that was good and uh, <laughs> it like, kind of felt uh, like we were in on the joke. Uh, good, good. Yeah, I think we were all enamored. One thing that I will run into with a lot of indie films just in general um, is just that so many of them take themselves too seriously mm. and also don't have the budget to back it up. Oh, God, mate, we've got to tell you about <laughs> Werewolves of the Third Reich. Oh, no, <laughs> no, shit. Normally we don't like shit in our movies, but we picked this for an ATM. Think it'll be, no, it's called Werewolves of the Third Reich. It's going to be fun, right? Even That's if it's a great bad. title. Yeah, even yeah, if it's it bad, it's going to be fun. But, oh, my God, it was aggressively aggressively boring. It's like the guy who made the movie just hated anyone who wanted to watch a movie called <laughs> Wales and Third Reich. Uh, so I get where you're coming from, the whole taking itself too seriously thing. I mean, it didn't even have a werewolf in it till like the last 10 minutes. And oh, was... that's ridiculous. No. <laughs> yeah. If you're making a movie called The Werewolves of the Third Reich, I want a rat, I want an entire group of Nazis who are dipshit werewolves. Yeah. <laughs> trying to, uh, like, I would have them be trying to pretend to be good Nazis and not let anyone else know that they're werewolves. Well, there you go. You've already read a better movie. Yeah. And let's be honest, <laughs> if you don't end with, like, you know, the good guys versus Hitler werewolf, you failed. <laughs> <laughs> right! <laughs> Here's how you end that movie. It's you, you got a bunch of uh, they're in their werewolf form, but they're like trying to pretend to be like Jews and stuff, and, like <laughs> occupying the camps. <laughs> you just got an entirely different direction. <laughs> I've got a vision. I kind of get what Bob's going for, but I'm not saying it in my voice. <laughs> He's gonna have to find yeah. those words himself. This is one of those Bevan moments. It's like yeah. you've got a plan that you can probably pull off. I'm not going there. Yeah. <laughs> we we have careers we like to keep. <laughs> Speaking of plans ah. to pull off, uh, filming Carousel 2, obviously we're all in a very contentious situation at the moment. How's that working out for you as a producer and a, a director? Is Are there a lot more challenges than there normally would be? I mean, we wrote Carousel 2 basically in March, April of 2020. So like right at the start of COVID-19 ramping up. And I had a feeling it wasn't going to be over in a couple months. I had a feeling that it was going to be real bad. So we did go out of our way to write the movie in a way so that we could minimize how many people would be in each scene, how many people would be on set as much as possible. So Carousel 2 does have a smaller cast overall and there will be scenes with less people on screen compared to carousel one but there will still be a lot of murder and mayhem i just wanted to do what i could in the writing process to make sure that we kept the number of people on set as low as possible uh we are definitely pushing uh masks on the entire time unless you're on screen acting and we might luck out in pa they're already rolling out the covid vaccine and yeah. you know if just before april it's out for phase two for the rest of us that aren't an essential worker. Most of the people on set are definitely already planning to get the vaccine anyway. Wait, you're in, you're in cool, PA? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm in, I'm in New Jersey. I'm like, too, too bad it's already, uh, it's already cast. I could drive out there in addition and be told, get the fuck out of here. Hey, who knows uh, Carousel 3? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> there is a plan for a trilogy, but we need Carousel 2 to make money first. Well, let's definitely hope that happens. 
<laughs> hint, hint, listeners. Yeah, hint, hint. Get out there, support it. I was a little bit sad <laughs> the Kickstarter not on Prime because I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to back the Carousel Two Kickstarter, but uh, we were too late. Unfortunately, well, at least succeeded, so it's still coming. Yeah, that's good. That's the good news. I'm glad you're considering the whole uh, COVID while shooting. I don't want Tom Cruise popping up out of nowhere and screaming at you. So, um, <laughs> I would be Tom Cruise. It's got to, yeah. He appears like a uh, COVID genie. I hear. <laughs> but, I mean, that was a fascinating journey. I'm really glad you went through your filmography there. That is, uh, I've always been really interested in low budget filmmaking, and that is, uh, it's fantastic to hear how all that linked up and the journey you've been on. Let me finish off just by talking about Carousel and what we liked about Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, please. All right, I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> right, because there's, there's something I want to ask, and you can feel free not to answer this. You've said, you know, you didn't intend to play Joe the Pizza Guy. I was watching Joe the Pizza Guy, and I was thinking, all right, this is the, uh, this is the Bruce Campbell for the, the post-ironic generation. <laughs> and then spoiler alert and I'm I'm happy given the spoiler here because I think people once I say the spoiler people are, are going to want to see it. Joe the pizza guy gets slowly murdered with a pizza cutter in a, a really long drawn out way. And yeah. I was thinking, oh man, I mean that's a really cool way to get murdered. No one I've never <laughs> seen anyone get murdered with a pizza cutter before. But Joe the pizza guy is dead. Now, can we expect to see a return of Joe the pizza guy or is he absolutely pizza cut to death i mean joe pretty clearly was pizza cuttered really hard in the first film and i am not acting in carousels 2's main plot uh, okay well, but i am drunk so i will say keep an eye out for the post credit scene and maybe I got really drunk and demanded to Aline Isley that i'm going to basically make joe what you ben affleck's batman in carousel 3 <laughs> so. Oops, did I say that out loud? <laughs> this is one of those movies that spoiler like spoilers just make you want to see it more. Yeah. <laughs> that is Agreed. true. Like like I already pitched her, like I want to do the exact same training montage that he does with like hitting the tire with the sledgehammer, throwing down just hundreds of pounds of weights while screaming, <laughs> just focused on murdering this unicorn out of revenge. <laughs> I mean, it was a toss-up between Cowboy Cool and Joe the Pizza Guy as as to who my favorite <laughs> horror antagonist is oh, now. Oh, God. Yeah. How, where, that's a question I had. Um, the Cowboy Cool, like, face costume, did y'all find that? Did y'all make that? It was weirdly well, creepy but fitting in a, in a right way. I did find that. So that, that character was definitely my idea. I was like, okay, there should be a mascot of the park, and that'll be the Dr. Loomis of the film. But I wanted to be like this ridiculous yeah. mascot character that's hunting down this unicorn to match the ridiculousness of the, the killer being a unicorn. Right. So I was like, um, cowboy cool. So I was like, we'll get like a cowboy mascot head, but he has a leather jacket because he's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just started looking online for like cowboy mascot heads, and I found this god awful Chinese knockoff of Woody. <laughs> and that's what I bought. <laughs> As soon as wow. you say that, I'm immediately like, yes, of course it is. Of yeah, course that's of course. what it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think I made a comment during the, during the viewing, but uh, yeah, that was perfect. Yeah. As soon as I saw the mask, I was like, boom, there's $300 well spent. I mean, it's not random <laughs> at all. It's like, there's a unicorn on the loose. You need a cowboy. You, got, you know, you, got, you want to wrangle an evil horse, you got to have a cowboy. That made perfect cool sense. It's, it's a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> I get that reference. <laughs> Come on, guys. Don't be shy. You were so excited that I was here. What questions did you have about Carousel? What was everyone's favorite Carousel kill? Machete. I, I'm sticking with that. Like, uh, okay. That the being the hooves manipulate the machete from behind and like do a wind up and everything it just it's there's so much physical comedy in that one brief little moment and it just kills me like i bent over laughing when i watched it mine was the kid getting hit by the car oh god you stole that from me motherfucker <laughs> oh. <laughs> i gotta say the two party stoners getting uh disemboweled by the unicorn 
after this. <laughs> they're like, oh, I love you so much, bro. I wish we could die together. And the unicorn just kills them. And they're like, oh, wishes are real. And the unicorn's <laughs> just like, what? Wishes aren't real? You guys are stupid. I'm just sitting there <laughs> watching this animated, barely animated unicorn who has just killed two people go, oh, you guys are ridiculous. I just thought, that's perfect. That is the perfect kind of little meta joke there. It's brilliant. All right. Well, my, my favorite was the one Bob already took, but I'll grab a second one. And I think, I think it's the character Sarah, where he just kind of like hooves her to death. And, yeah. But it's just like, it's funny because it's just like, okay, you're just gently touching the actress's face with this like thing. We were and just like, being like, this is fucking stupid. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> so one of my favorite bits uh, is definitely when the unicorn infiltrates the home by dressing up like a pizza guy despite the fact that there is already the pizza guy i i was just curious did you have any alt costumes or anything it's such a great bit but like i could have watched like that unicorn go through five different outfit changes <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying no. to find the right one that was my first idea and only idea we shot but i'll keep that in mind for future films <laughs> i really did love that actually because there's a carousel unicorn and you've got it and you don't try to do too much of it and that's part of the humor. We don't see it move. His Absolutely. mouth doesn't move. But then at the end, he's driving along and giving his monologue and he's just got a little cigarette in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> a little touch he's had a long head. night. Yeah. Wrapped a bandage around his throat so he can heal up. <laughs> just little touches. It's all it took just to bring that to life. Yeah, it was hilarious and a little bit artful. I really appreciate that. Well, well, what I, what I like is what I like is that, that was very Sam Raimi esque. Um, you mentioned that earlier, but like you know, if you go back to the Evil Dead films, you know he did that a lot, where he would just take like a static mask, and that's the essentially the entire special effect of the monster. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, again, it's like uh, animated object killers are a fun thing, but the, it's so easy to go too far, and that's why. Aline and I both were like, we don't want this thing to be animated too much. We'll see a hoof move. We'll see him do things that would require animation, but we are not having like a latex mm. suit. This is going to be a hard plastic carousel unicorn. And that's the amount of movement he has throughout the whole film. I, it is 100% the right choice. Yes. Uh, I laughed so many times at that. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, someone's uh, favorite kill was obviously um, Lunchbox getting killed. Again, spoilers, but fuck it. Yeah. It's in the trailer anyway. <laughs> Wild I put it there. Um, but that was really important to me when I was writing it, too. I was like, I want everyone to think the movie's over when Lunchbox <laughs> walks away and it fades to black. I want everyone in this screening to be like, oh, this fucking brat live? Fuck. <laughs> well, of course they are going to kill the kid. Kid gets hit. Fucking... I have never heard such thunderous applause as I have in, like, the first three as hell. Just making people think they aren't getting what they want, but then giving it to them on a, the most silver platter possible. It, 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 it's great, because Lunchbox is just a hateable character, but at the same time, like, you know, being an adult, you, you want to think you're a decent person, you don't want to see the kid get it. So it's kind of like a combination of, yeah, this is great, goddamn, I'm an awful person. <laughs> no, I, I think it's more like, oh, I don't have to admit I wanted to see this. I can just blame it on the filmmaker and <laughs> I still enjoyed it. I, I definitely wanted Lunchbox to be a character you hated. Mm. To me, this was a revenge movie where Duke is the protagonist. Duke is right. <laughs> I mean, he has some valid points. I'm not going to. Maybe lie. he didn't have to kill Joe, but other than that. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it is. It is a wild ride of a, of a movie. And, uh, uh, it's it's one of, it's one of those rare movies that punches above its weight class and does so effectively. Well, thank you very much. Here's a question: I... um, You did this for such a low budget. Were all your actors like hobos or what? <laughs> no, they all got paid a day. They all got paid a day rate. You know, they're not, all working. Not actors. my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, everyone that worked on the film does have a home. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's good to know as well. I guess. <laughs> Seems kind of classist of you, really. <laughs> You're right. It was classist of me to not hire any hobos. Uh, maybe going forward, I will not be as problematic with my casting choices. Good to hear. Uh, so we've talked about our favorite kills. 
I'm kind of curious, like, just what your favorite one was, because, you know, you obviously got to be there for the filming of them, so there might be a little bit more sentiment or something behind that. Um, I think, for me, my favorite kill is probably... I mean, I gotta go with the, the Pez dispenser head. Uh, that is Cody. That's the makeup guy who gets killed like that. That's his oh. little cameo in the movie. Um, and it's my favorite if no for no other reason other than it somehow happened perfectly. That shot where the fake head falls onto the ground and it, the eye is perfectly lined up with the shot. Accident. First take. Oh my god. We're done. Everyone so- go home. Nice. Yeah, like that that's a trailer moment kill. That it looks really good. Yeah, it does. And because of that and again, that's another good that's an example of practical and CG being tools that you should both use. So mm-hmm. like CGing Cody's face onto the fake head up until the moment of the kick. Because I run into a lot of people that are like they over depend on CG and there's like the same CG blood spurts I see in a bunch of movies and it looks terrible and fake. Mm. But I do also run into a lot of people that are like, if it can't be practical, I'm not doing it. And like refuse to use any CG help Mm. when I really think you should use all the tools that you can to make things look the best that they can. Absolutely. I mean, it's testament. I didn't even I didn't notice it was a CG effect at the time. So again, it's just it's just CG. Mm in terms of his face being on the fake head, as yeah. soon as the hook touches the head, then it's all practical from there on out. I think there are definitely movies I watch where you can tell that somebody's just said, ah, we'll solve this in post. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> no, that marriage of <laughs> practical and digital. I try to solve it on set. Or at yeah. least if we know we're going to do something in post, that's part of the plan as well. You know, like, fucking laser eyes, we're going to do that in post. <laughs> that's fine <laughs> mm, fair. yeah that would have no, been difficult to practical. <laughs> but Aline's big thing Aline's big thing her line in the sand was I want rainbow blood to come out of Duke's neck and during the writing <laughs> process I was the one saying like I don't know if this is going to fucking work I don't know if we can fucking do that like I think that it's all going to blend together and not look good and Cody was like I got a plan and he set up this fucking insane tube system of seven different tubes under the stunt head and cut out this one piece with like the CO this like CO2 cartridge and as soon as he hit the button the neck would burst out like you see in the movie and he just like pushes down on this insane device that he put together in order to push seven tubes of liquid <laughs> through this neck so that all of the colors would be separate and backlit so you can see all of them i was like how the fuck did this work ah that's beautiful mm. that was a beautiful moment yeah that looked really good. That exists because Aline pushed for it and because Cody worked his science, I guess. Yeah. Uh, even though I was watching it, I thought, that's a nice like mechanical effect there. And a nice yeah, payoff I, as well. I truly assumed like it had been, like you'd had to recolor it on the, like obviously the, the liquid was real. I assumed like the colors had been put in digitally and just done like a masterful job. But mm-hmm. yeah, practical makes a lot more sense. Mm. Yep. And there's something about it as well that it was just, you didn't, even watching, it was like, you didn't have to do that. The, the movie could have not done that at all. But the fact that you did, just that little payoff, oh, he gets stabbed in the neck, and rainbow blood comes out, because of course it does. <laughs> yeah, Just a nice little touch. Is Cody, like, a professional special effects guy, or is he just, like, a, tal- a talented, like, you know, hacker at this? Oh, no, he is definitely a professional. He's been doing this for years. He actually taught at the Tom Savini School for a long time because of how high quality he is. He currently works for an effects studio in... You know what? I don't want to say how much because the studio has some NDAs and he's working on stuff that he can't talk about. So I don't want to give away any words or terms that will break any of that. So I'm not going to say anything else, but he works legit on this stuff. Well, it's a chap to follow there, I think. Yeah. 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 So I'm very excited. He's working on Robbie now. Uh, who should be done before March. Robbie is Duke's son. <laughs> he was born at the end of Carousel 1, if you watched through the first credits a bit. Of course. Which we uh, definitely yeah, did. I, Which we definitely I am did. a Robert, and I will be the first to say that everyone who chooses to go by Robbie is a fucking dick. <laughs> I mean, Rob, Robbie is five years old, Robert. Yeah, well... <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna be a dick. <laughs> well, he will with that attitude. On the contrary, Robbie is a sweetheart. Yeah, we'll see. 
That was one. Of, that was one of my hard pitches. Was like, okay, Carousel One is about a kid that everyone wants to see dead. I want Carousel Two to be about a kid that everyone wants to protect, like a soft little snowflake. Like, well, you no shouldn't have called him Robert. fucking Robbie. Well, clearly Robert is coming into this film with a bias, but I hope other people watching Carousel the Second there will have go. a different opinion. Not anyone who's known a Robbie. If you can change Bevan's cold, cruel heart, <laughs> then you would have uh, succeeded. Because he's going to be watching this, like, you know, just be like, die, die, die. <laughs> I fucking live this. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my unicorn dad, this is my life. <laughs> I cannot wait to see Carousel 2. Hmm. I can't either. <laughs> well, I mean, I really hope people enjoy it because this is, I've never had this level of stress in making a movie before. You know, like the Meowy sequels were just whatever. You know, it wasn't like a rabid fan base. It wasn't like super passionate. It was just like, okay, I'm just going to keep doing holidays, keep continuing the story in an insane way. Um, the Survivors uh, was like, oh, I forgot to mention the Survivors during my filmography. That was my Avengers movie where all the surviving main characters of the previous four films teamed up to kill the killers from everyone must die that came nice. out in 2015 as well um but what was i about to say i don't remember oh yes uh it's stress uh yeah. because unlike any of my other films this is the first time i'm really the first time i'm making a sequel to a movie that has like so much love and like fans that like really really care about the movie and i really hope that i deliver something that can come near matching that if not surpass it what they're loving is you i uh, uh, the effort you put in that's what i'm hoping yeah no there's there's nothing about that movie that's like not you that's that's wonderful <laughs> but, but it, it's all, i mean that that sounded like an insult no but I'm, it wasn't meant to be <laughs> I took it as a compliment, so right, good, you yeah, good, yeah, yeah. Now, what did you mean by that? You said no, 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 no. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. <laughs> Fucking Robbie think, over here. I think oh, we all heard oh. it as a compliment until <laughs> Bob was like, "No, I'm sorry about that." That's like going up to someone and being like, "Wow, you have the most beautiful smile I've ever seen." Oh, thank you. That wasn't a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> David over here like, oh, you're a really charismatic filmmaker, you prick. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. Um, but for me with sequels is that I don't want to see just the same thing again every time. It would have been so easy to film Carousel 2 being about someone like spits gum at Duke and then Duke hunts that person down and kills the house full of that person's friends. And I refused to do that. If I was making uh, Carousel 2, I wanted it to be an actual character continuation in terms of Duke having an arc of growing as a person, or should we say unicorn, um, and what that would actually mean years later in his life and what that story could be. So just part of my concern with Carousel the Second is that there might be people watching that expecting just Duke goes to a house and kills 15 people again, and the movie's not that. But there is still a lot of humor, a lot of jokes, a lot of laughs, a lot of comedy, and a lot of bloody kills. Well, yeah, it's... that's the formula. There you go. Mm. <laughs> but it's really great to hear as, you know, a low-budget filmmaker and somebody who's in, mostly in control of their own creative properties to hear that you're kind of pushing the boundaries of what you can do and uh, making movies out of spite. This is like an indie inspiration <laughs> story. So... <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm glad. I hope I inspire other people to make things out of spite. Oh, definitely. That's the best way Absolutely. to make Absolutely. Oh, 100%. All right. So that was intriguing and fascinating, and I can't wait to see what Carousel 2 brings us. Uh, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and we hope you'll join us again in the future uh, after the blood and ashes have settled of Carousel 2 to tell us how <laughs> it went. Uh, I would be happy to be back on the show. Uh, this was a uh, a joy. Thank you, all of you, for sucking my dick so well. Uh, <laughs> you made me feel really good about myself as a creator. It meant a lot to me. Uh, you really you really boosted my ego. So I'm going to walk into Carousel 2 uh, with a goddamn uh, theme song playing. Like a pro wrestler. <laughs> Excellent. Well, hey, <laughs> just, just wait till you get it in person. <laughs> 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 okay, so before we're finished uh, fully wiping our lips, tell us uh, tell us where we can find you and where we can where people can uh, can grab your movies from. 
Absolutely. If you would like to look at my main website, which lists all of my movies and everything that you can uh, buy physically, you can buy here. Uh, Silverspotlightfilms.com. That is the main website for my production company. Again, all my movies are listed there. Every movie has its own little page, so you can like find the trailer, find some reviews, find the synopsis. Uh, the store is there for all of the DVDs, for all of the Blu-rays. Uh, some posters are there uh, for my 10-year anniversary of making movies. I actually released a vinyl album this year, which has a bunch of the music from all of my movies from the past 10 years. So, like, side one has all of the lyrical theme songs, and then side two has a bunch of the scores by Steve O'Bortz, who was my main composer. Um, nice. I only make, like, $3 for each one of those vinyls that I sell, so please don't scoff at the $50 price mark. That is literally as low as I can make it. Um okay. But I think it's just a cool little collector's thing. I'm glad that it exists. I made it mostly for me, but a few fans have really appreciated that it exists too. So I think that's cool. Uh, if you would like to check out my library, but you don't want to buy 11 DVDs, stevebuster.com. It is basically my streaming service. Uh, right? It is like as lo it is as low as two dollars and ninety nine cents a month. It has 25 hours of content right now. It has every bonus feature from every DVD and Blu-ray that I've released, except for the audio commentaries. It has every movie that I have made on the service, and it has every short that I've made. It has movies from before The Slasher Hunter, which are not available for sale anymore. It has two of my old online series, re-skinned up to 720p HD, even though they were shot on standard definition, tried to up it to HD for, you know, the remaster, uh, the remix edition, if you will, if you're a Kingdom Hearts fan. And there's a bunch of content on there, $2.99 a month. And not only that, but it's all unlisted YouTube videos. So you can subscribe for a month and save everything and watch it later. I don't even fucking care. Just please subscribe for a month first and don't share it. <laughs> But that is the cheapest way to access everything that I've made digitally that is still better than streaming it on Prime or Tubi because I get all of that like two ninety nine cut, which is like like one person subscribing for a month for three dollars is equivalent to three hundred people streaming one of my movies on Prime. So to me, it's a win. Mm. And if if you don't even want to do that, again, a lot of my movies are on Tubi TV. If you don't want to do Tubi, a good chunk of my movies are on Prime Video. Those are other legal avenues to support me, and I do appreciate it. I'm just giving you a ranking. Buying physical, number one. Steve Buster, number two. Tubi, number three. Prime, number four. Well, that sounds like a, a perfect Saturday night for our listeners there. Get yourself some junk food. Get yourself some beers. Check out stevebuster.com. Watch some uh, madness. <laughs> you can watch the uncut carousel first and then just go crazy. and yeah. just fall into whatever you want to fall into is a unicorn sex scene it pays for itself there you go <laughs> i was gonna say know that your 299 is equal to 300 of those uh those prime uh yeah. murderers yeah. supporting yeah. the creators yeah <laughs> okay well that was a lot of fun uh we hope to speak to steve again in the future and we hope that you'll join us again next week for continuing adventures of authors and dragons uh so we'll see you later bye 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 bye, bye.